I'd like to play the sounds that anyone growing up in Davis would remember waking up to the crop dusters working the tomato fields outside of Davis and the trains coming through going north or east. was born September 17th, 1952. My mom and dad had lived in Danville at that time, a little crossroads with a, a store, a gas station, a mechanic. They lived on a, a ranch in which they rented a small house. Mom had had at least she had four miscarriages and so uh, i became a des baby okay diethyl stilbestrol which was being used in those days to help pregnancy through pregnancies mom stayed in bed for i guess six months out there in Danville and that has had its effect on me I'm in bed now it's the favorite place for me to go to recoup myself and I read which is what she did living out in the country she didn't have much company dad was a coach at San Ramon High School mom and dad had rented a house in Danville on the Engelhart Ranch. Betty Engelhart was from a wealthy family or something to do with machine tools. Bear, B-E-H-R. We still have a letter from her. She was a, a, a great lady. Mom and dad loved her. They would visit mom. They had two collies then, Star and Locke. I remember growing up with Star. I think Locke must have died before my memory. They had cats also and they used to go out and come back and moms pet them and they would have poison oak. They lived out in the countryside. Mom took me to see the house. I think it was in the late 70s. By the time we saw it, it was part of a neighborhood in a cul-de-sac, but she pointed it out and said, that's where I was pregnant with you. She spent five months in bed, just getting up to go to the bathroom and do a little bit of stuff. And so here I am in my sanctuary outside of my house and it's my go-to place. Mom and dad had met at how after dad got out of the Navy as a flyer of the fighter planes, he went and played the football with Cal. He had met Phil Arnott before the war in 1942, and then they both joined. Got back in 1945. We started Cal in 1946. Dad played for the legendary Happy Waldorf, Cal coach, who took them to the Rose Bowl. January 1st, 1949. Mom and dad had met. On a blind date, Dad said, I have two collie dogs. They met on Cal campus and later married and spent a fair amount of time in Yosemite. They both worked summers for Curry Company and then was hired at Davis, UC Davis, to be an assistant coach, football coach in 1952. And he came to Davis, and Ted Forbes, one of the coaches back then, told him, hey, there's a house around the corner from where I live, on South Campus Way, is where he lived, and Sunset Court was where the house was. Dad looked at it and bought it uh, with the help of the GI Bill for $11,500. The rest is history. Mom used to like to tell the story about how when he came back and said, I bought a house, she said, well, what does it, what does the kitchen look like? And he couldn't describe to her the kitchen, but he bought it in Sunset Court, the cul-de-sac, and it couldn't have been a better place to grow up. I like to say that I'm one of those who 
won the lot, uh, lottery of life, being born a boomer, good parents, growing up in Sunset Court with so many great families, 20, 25 kids growing up there. Dad had gone to Davis and bought the Sunset Court house just around the corner from Ted Forbes, Ted and Dottie at rest. So anyway, September, uh, must have been early September, late August, that they moved to Davis, um, and I was born in the Woodland Clinic, which now has been surrounded by the Woodland, um, you know, the Woodland Clinic Hospital, Dignity Health, um, and my first memories are, uh, were of, um, of, of being in Yosemite, actually. It must have been, it was the summer of 1955 when I, just before I was three years old, I remember playing in a little red uh, airplane that was there for children. The other memory I have up there is they, uh, Dad had a, a thing that he kept in the garage, this doll wooden thing that had lead in, in you know, I just remember this hole w inside it with lead and it was called Mr. Belvedere and he would, it was uh, for putting into the, uh, I guess it was uh, the Tuolumne River where we used to go and he would put it in two or three feet of water and teach us to, to put our heads underwater. And so that is what I remember uh, of um, Berkeley Tuolumne Camp. And then growing up in Sunset Court, uh, I just, I remember the field that was Elmwood. I remember having a sandbox in the backyard towards um, the back towards um, the Boers and the, and Warren's uh, yards. And one year mom planted Indian corn. And um, at that time, Indian corn, of course, was corn that had you know, different, um, you know, colors of the grain, the, the corn cobs, corn ears would come out with purple and blue and yellow and white uh, corn grains. And I remember asking mom if we could eat it. And she said, oh, no, that it's not for eating. <laughs> she denied that later. So growing up in Sunset Court and playing with the, the, the neighborhood, the neighbor kids, Martha Harris, Craig Harris, Dickie Plo, um, Dennis Plo. Uh, of course, Warren Hardiker was our favorite babysitter back then because he would let us stay up and watch things like Gunsmoke and and The Rifleman and things like that, uh, The Twilight Zone. Um, and let's see, our babysitters were another na lady named Doris. I think it was Doris Allen. Uh, Mom and Dad had a, a rocking chair and... Dad used to get up and rock us. Um, I, I remember him. It was a squeaky rocking chair, and so Mom would remember that, you know, when, when one of us would wake up in the middle of the night, and Dad would take us and rock in that squeaky rocking chair next to the furnace in the living room. Um, on We had those braided rugs from Aunt... One of our aunt, aunts, one of grandma's sisters. Um, then I had trouble sleeping, I remember, um, and would go and say, Mom, Daddy, I can't sleep. And then Dad would, okay, he'd make a little room, like one foot of room, and he would turn his back to me. And it was like this wall. I remember as a little, you know, four year old or something, and, and this sleeping on this little edge of the bed about you know, one foot or less um, edge of the bed. And um, I guess that would get me back to, to my bed. In 1957, we moved to Berkeley for Dad to do his doctorate uh, in the uh, in Parker lab, uh, a well-known lab of physical education. He did his PhD in kinesiology. We lived on Grove Street, which is now Cesar Chavez Street. Uh, in a house, uh, on the, we were on the first floor. The second floor was um, a male, a postman, uh, and his wife, older. Next door were Lynn and Daryl Williams, 
Uh, and then on the other side were uh, a Chinese family with two daughters, and the, the Chinese mother was so strict she never, ever let her daughters uh, have any contact with us. And so um, we would go play with uh, Lynn and Daryl. Uh, Daryl was my age. We went to a Washington school there uh, a, a block or two away on Grove Street. I went to first grade. Um, my teacher, Mrs. Um, uh, back then, Mom didn't like her. She was overly sort of, I guess, um, Mom, you know, just didn't like her. But we, I remember the Dick and Jane and Spot books that we all did, and I remember doing the uh, the little the drills of hiding under our desks, uh, getting under our desk for a drill, as a, you know, as an uh, uh, that they were doing back then against the uh, two. Um, as a re response to possible nuclear attack, um, the other thing I remember, the, the the playground was all pavement. There wasn't a single blade of grass in that entire school. And um, I remember playing dodgeball, and the, I remember the black kids could just throw that ball really hard, man. Wow. You had to watch out. You had to be pretty careful. I remember also walking um, up to the... Berkeley City Library by myself at the age of six and getting books. I loved books back then, still do. Um, my second, the second part of first grade was I went from an annex building where Mrs. Scott to the bigger building where my teacher was um, a black lady, Mrs. Miss McKinley. And back then the way we learned to write was they would pass out a, what do they call that, purple mimeograph piece of paper with letters on it, and we would trace over until, you know, with pencil until we practically, you know, wore through the, the paper, the letters. Mike and I used to play in the backyard and make these, create these things from boxes and wood and stuff called inker bonkers and cockerdooners. Um, we, our room was in the basement of that house, and one day I remember, I was always the one who, somehow, Dad, I would wake up, you know, Dad would think I was a, a an intruder, so one day I was walking up the stairs and there was a light from the, you know, walking up the stairs from the basement, there was a light, you know, at the, at the bottom, and so this shadow was cast up, and Dad, um, saw that shadow and this thing, you know, this huge shadow, you know, obviously walking up the stairs and he jumped into the doorway and yelled and, and I was, <laughs> it's me, it's me, it's me. And the same thing happened in, in Malawi when I went to let China, our dog, out uh, and was walking back. He did the same thing. I don't think it happened to any other of my brothers. Um, so then we moved back to Davis uh, and I started second grade with Mrs. Storrs, um, and I, I had some problems, I, I recall. I was um, fidgeting so much that I somehow dislocated my hip, and they put me in crutches, and I had to walk around with crutches. Uh, they did send me to a speech therapist so that I could, and I still remember closing my teeth to say the, the, the letter F, as in Sam, Hannah Bauer, Herb and Hannah Bauer. And Hannah was uh, a speech therapist, I guess, and taught me how to close my teeth to say S, the letter S, because I guess I was lithping. Mom used to take us to campus to see, to visit the animals. So first were the, the radiated beagles, which were about where the baseball field is now and became famous because they were radioactive waste after they terminated that project. They had debarked those the dogs and they always used to come to the fence. It was a, two fences that separated us from them. Um, then we would go to the see the cows. Mom would always greet them with a you know, 
a moo or and then the sheep out um, out there near the Finley's house where we used to go ride our bikes and um, shoot uh, John Finley's pellet gun. Uh, then there were the, I would go see the horses. And then sometimes we would go see the pigs, the, the hog barns. And there was a man named Mr. Moore who ran the hog barns who we really liked. That was a little ritual that mom used to um, always take us to. I think in about 1956, a an Air Force a fighter jet was running out of gas or the pilot thought he was running out of gas he was on running on fumes and landed at the UC Davis Airport and word got around and we all went out there the uh, I guess it was the next day or later that day because the, um, the the runway wasn't long enough for the jet to take off again once it was refueled so they had to tow it to I-80, uh, Interstate 80, to get it back uh, and, and tow it all the way then to Travis Air Force Base, which um, back in 1955, that kind of thing was probably, was definitely a lot easier than it would be now. Then, about that same year, I think it must have been June of 1955 we had a house fire because I remember oh probably it must have been a, f a few dozen or a few score students out in the court uh, and mom said it was during finals week so it must have been June because it was warm of uh, 55 I think I was almost four years old but mom had um, put stuff in the dryer and back then they didn't have you know all the the safety stuff and the lint trap caught fire and caught the garage caught fire burned um, stuff like my dad's Cal football jersey and I just remember being taken over to the Herman's next door um, and having them take care of Mike and I Dad was the football coach and baseball um, of UC Davis in the 1950s and early 60s. And so I used to go on some of the trips back then. They had a yellow type of school bus. And Bill Kruger, the locker room attendant with the stogie, uh, used to drive the bus. And occasionally I would go, yeah, probably once a season, I would be allowed to get on the bus with the team and I recall one trip going up to Chico. Dickie Plo, I think, would go along. I remember dad's players um, coming over to the house. They, at my, dad's memorial service, they, you know, quite a few of them said we really, we, we just, been, you know, we, we loved your parents because they helped us out you know, when we were first in town. Most of the players were from valley towns, farm boys from up north. I remember Dad taking Dickie Plo and I up to recruit a quarterback who just graduated from high school, Dick Carrier. We went up to his family's rice farm in Willows, and Mrs. Carrier gave us bowls of ice cream, big bowls of ice cream. It was a hot day. Dick ended up coming to Davis and being a becoming a star quarterback. I saw him at Dad's memorial service. He still runs their farm of rice and walnuts. We used to be bat boys also for the baseball team. I remember Jack Anderson, who became a rich, a wealthy farmer, local farmer. He would hit that ball all the way to Russell Boulevard. He was a big, tall guy, six foot four. Grandma Lauder used to come to one game a year, along with Pamp, and uh, I remember they had a, must have been 1962, they had a 
really, you know, a devastating loss. I think it was, I can't remember who it was to, maybe humble. It was in Davis. Grandma was standing outside the locker room and when dad came out, you know, with really down, it was a tough loss. Dad used to relate this because, you know, it was grandma all the way. She told him, Willard, just think how happy you made those other players. Then there was the the game at Humboldt one year, I think it was 62, when the local timekeeper held back the clock so that Humboldt could move down the field and score and win the game. They were pretty down about that. They won the conference in 1963, Dad having brought them in, th in three years from being uh, from a 0-9 record to winning the conference. Later, I used to hang out in the locker room. Uh, they had a small coach's locker room. And so, you know, those, those coaches who families we all grew up with, Herb Schmallenberger, Bob Brooks, Dean Ryan, they, they were all there. Another stalwart was Dick Lewis, the trainer. The, um, what they call him, a trainer. He was the first aid guy. He was, had a, a training room with, you know, hot, um, it wasn't hot tubs, but it was, they were whirlpools and stuff. And he was very, very widely respected guy. And, uh, Betty Lewis, who was 90, Four ninety-five just died, I think, a year ago. She lived on in that house on L Street. That is what I'm remembering, being around the coaches and the dad's work. Dad used to, on rainy weekends, used to take us, and the Plows and the Ryans would show up with their kids and to the Hickey Gym. We, we, would, we could play. We'd just run, take our shoes off, and slide in our socks. The Plo, Dickie and Dennis Plo would come. And um, Dickie and I discovered the old boxing room, the old room where all the boxing gloves, a long defunct program, no longer had boxing, but the old boxing room was still there. We used to, the boxing gloves all lined up in little rows and various equipment. We tried boxing a little bit. Then, of course, there were the Aggie basketball games in Hickey Gym with the inimitable Bob Hamilton um, having tantrums, throwing his towel behind him into the crowd. Um, it looked like he was a, you know, terrible coach, you know, yelling at his players, but his players loved him. And Hickey Gym was known as a, a tomb. Um for these basketball games. They often won the league. That's it. That's what I can remember. I do, I next remember going to see John F. Kennedy speak at the UC Berkeley Coliseum. It must have been when he was running for president in 1960. And then, of course, When he was assassinated in 1963, November 22nd, I was selling milk in the cafeteria line at West Davis Elementary, selling milk, little milk cartons for a nickel. And Sarah Motley came up to me and 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 now you know told me the the news. And growing up in Davis, I played little league. Baseball first, peanut league for a year, and then I really wanted to go to the Coast League, which I was told, no, stay in the peanut league another year, but I begged and they let me go play for the Giants in the Coast League out there in the baseball park near the railroad tracks of um, F Street. And so they put me in right field, and I remember... The first ball I got, I, it was a real shallow kind of a, what would ordinarily be a single, but the kid was sort of trotting very slowly to first base, so I threw him out 
at first base. <laughs> and they, the coach, I think it was Paul Robert, back then he, he said, okay. He put me at shortstop, and I played there for the next two years and also pitched. It was average, a little bit. You know, Dad used to take us for batting practice and coached us a lot, so I could get a little bit better. And it was the same with tennis. Oh, but one baseball story I got to tell. Coast League Giants playing the Cards, Cardinals. We were behind 12 to 9. It was the last inning, which I think was, you know, the top of the sixth or something. Bottom of the sixth. Down 12 to 9. Bases loaded. I was on second, I guess. Two outs. And up comes David Mata, who was, and for many years, was about as wide as he was tall and so he couldn't run very fast but he had some power behind you know get all that weight well he took two strikes and then hit the ball out of the out of the park grand slam we won 13 12. yeah that's a great story dave mata and his brother alex alex is still they're still around town and then there was tennis i played tennis we, we had tournaments i played in the boys tournaments and you know, got trophies and stuff. We played a lot against the Woodland, uh, with and against Woodland uh, in these tournaments. Marty Seeger, Brian Hahn, uh, Tom Taylor, Billy Taylor, um, the Hanson kids, Bobby Hanson of Woodland. Um, and as I said before, Saturday mornings, Sunday mornings, it was very social. Mom had us taking piano lessons when we were in Berkeley from Grandma Lauder, who was a lifelong piano teacher. And then when we got back, um, I, I, was, I went for lessons from Mrs. Harder, who must have been in her 80s, around the corner. And I remember playing in a recital, Pomp and Circumstance. Well, I should have stuck with piano. I begged my mom and dad, you know, let me quit. I didn't like it. I wanted to do sports. And now I learned that, you know, if I have any talent at all, it's much more with music than with sports. Anyway, that's what happens, you know, as the oldest son of a coach and star athlete. So the rest is history. So growing up in Sunset Court, we had a just a, a great neighborhood uh, of families from the early 50s. Um, and a remarkable number of the men were World War II veterans, uh, Tom Allen, okay, there was Tom and Pat Allen who had Kathy, Tim, Jackie, and Keith, four kids. Tom was a, a veteran of the Pacific War as a submarine officer, and he wrote a, an autobiography about growing up in the Santa Clara Valley on a farm, on a fruit farm which is what it was back then. Then next, that was um, on the corner there of Sunset Court, and then next to them was were the Plows, Larry and Nat Plow with uh, Dickie Plow, who was born the same year as I was, and we were, we were sort of inseparable for those first dozen years. Um, so there's Dickie, Dennis, um, Liz, Jim, and John. And Larry was the pilot of a B-24 plane at the end of the war. And he flew prisoners from, he flew the uh, U.S. prisoners of war from Japan to, I think it was Guam. And so if you watched that movie or read the book, Larry was flying those prisoners, those U.S. Pr prisoners uh, of, who had been in prisoners of war of the Japanese, he was flying them to, to Guam, and so he, he looked in his logbook and he tried to find uh, Louis Zamperini's about the exact day that Zamperini uh, was flown and couldn't find any anything. But he, Larry also wrote up uh, uh, yeah, his experiences in World War, World War II, and I collected all those books and gave them to Nancy Hardiker, our next-door neighbor. And so um, next to... The Plows uh, was Mrs. Townsend back then, and she had a severely 
retarded daughter Mary. Mrs. Townsend was, um, she was older, she must have been in her 60s or 70s, and she had this uh, Volvo, um, actually back then we called them station wagons, it was just a little, tiny little van, like a bubble thing, and she um, and drove that. Then next to her were the Harrises, uh, with um, Dan Harris, Martha, and Craig. Martha was my age and was in school all, all from kindergarten all through high school together. Uh, and so Dick Harris was a navigator in the Navy. And so that makes, what, three of them. My dad, Will, um, Tom Allen and uh, Dick Harris all in the Navy and Dick Harris was a professor of pomology he was the tree man he wrote the book Arboriculture that I could tell people you know across the world my neighbor wrote Arboriculture and if it was a tree person they oh yeah I have that book I you know, had it in university or whatever and um, Dick and Vera were very proper people Dick was very precise and there was a story about him um, they, uh, it was a navigator on a Navy ship, a large ship. I can't remember what, and whether it was a cruiser, might have been a cruiser, and um, or a destroyer. And they were heading towards. Uh, they wanted to get into Rio de Janeiro, and there was dense fog, and uh, so they were. Dick was, you know, doing the navigating and charting, and and they were all. Um, wondering where they were going to end up. They knew they were going to hit land somewhere. And right uh, about the time that he, uh, uh, guess, you know, that he estimated the, the clouds, the fog cleared, and there was the Pau de Azucar the, with the statue on top. He had directed, he had taken them straight, directly, precisely into Rio de Janeiro. And so then next to um, the Harrises were the Hermans, Roland and Barbara Herman. Roland was a GI during World War II and met Barbara, who was German. I don't know the rest of the story. They had um, two kids, uh, Christine and Ingrid. And Christine was my age because she was in, I did notice she was in my kindergarten class, but she's very shy. And then uh, in about, I think, by the time we got back from Africa, they, both girls had, um, they, uh, parents had sent them off to private schools back east. So we didn't get to know them really well, except that you know we were next door neighbors all of our lives. Roland was a professor of German, tall, very soft spoken, very kind man, and Barbara worked in the UC Davis library uh, and loved uh, reading. I used to borrow. She used to give me her back issues of the New York Review of Books, as well as the New Yorker. And then next to the Hermans, we were the Lauders, us, and in September 1952, moved there. Then uh, next to us on the other side were the, were the Hardikers, Lorne and um, Rose Hardiker, and their two sons, Morley, the oldest, and Warren. And Warren was our, our you know, favorite babysitter, and he collected things and we would collect you know so he would collect coins we would collect coins he would collect stamps we would collect stamps he would collect model cars we would go and buy model cars and make them he we were his farm system so he would say oh, i'll give you a hundred these hundred stamps if you give me that one and so that was dicky and i dicky plo and i and so uh and then morley was a sports car buff he loved the uh MG. He had an MG early on, and he bought an XKE Jag, and that was his precious car. And we had to be really careful when we played ball around that car. Very careful. Then next to them were um, originally Professor Starr with Nini Starr, and then later, I think it was in the mid, in the early 60s, the Grossmans moved there, and uh, Chuck Grossman worked for the physical plant. Uh, along with Larry, Larry Plo was um, was in the um, warehouse and the and purchasing, um, and uh, so Chuck, uh, that was Chuck and Rebecca Grossman, and their kids were uh, Margaret and Mark, 
and they, uh, Rebecca loved dogs. She used to train the uh, dogs, guide dogs for the blind. Chuck um, tragically died of a heart attack, the first of the uh, tragic, you know, sort of deaths of Sunset Court back in, yeah, it must have been about 1968, 69. He died of a, died of a heart attack. So that's Sunset Court. And then around the corner, there were the Tates, Mrs. Tate, who was my third grade teacher, and their son, Milton. So, uh, and then on the other side, around the corner from the Roastmans, were the Boers, Boers and uh, Vi Boer, and their two sons, Dickie uh, Boer and John Boer. They bought a, a um, wine store downtown, Ups. And then down Oste, there were um, the Williams, Bill, and Patty Williams. Behind our house in Elmwood, Joan Snodgrass and built a house after their tragic fire in about 19, oh, I want to say 1969 or 70, in which um, the father, Mr. Snodgrass, died and, and, a, and a young brother um, in a house fire. Tragic. Joan Snodgrass's daughter, Marcy, inherited the house and Marcy's daughter shocked the women's Iron Man world uh, with an upset victory in, in that Iron Man in Hawaii. And she grew up just three or four doors, houses away from the home where David Scott had grown up, the legendary Iron Man who won, I think, five of them back in the early 1980s. Also in Elmwood were the Youngermans. Um, John Youngerman was a professor of physics who came in the early 60s and, as I recall, had something to do with what we called the Atom Smasher, which we used to go, you know, when it was being built, we used to go, you know, play around in there. Elmwood was built later. You know, I remember Elmwood being just a big field, and then it was in the late 50s it was built. But architecturally, all different. It was, it's very, very well done. Um, different architecture for each house instead of, you know, the, the Oste Manor where, where we all, where we grew up, where all, that was one of the first tracked uh, housing developments in Northern California. And we all rode our bikes to school back then, down to West Davis Elementary, which later became Cesar Chavez School from, and I went from kindergarten through sixth grade, except for that uh, one year in Berkeley. After second grade with Mrs. Stores, I had third grade with Mrs. Tate, who lived around the corner, and their son Milton was part of our Sunset Court uh, neighborhood. Fourth grade was whew, Mrs. Hunt, I think. Fifth grade was Mrs. Daniels, and Mrs. Daniels read to us the entire series of books of the Little Britches books by Ralph Moody, which I started to read again just a year ago. And they are, they're just wonderful books. We were transfixed. She would always read to us right after the noon time, there was lunch and then, and then, uh, you know, recess time out in, you know, lunch and, and then a long period where we could play baseball or dodgeball or uh, whatever things we were doing, having races. Um, the fastest runners were Jeff Ferris, who was not, you know, he was just a quiet, sort of a smart guy from Elmwood, and Carolyn Jones. Uh, and, um, we would, or we would play softball out in the, beyond the pave, the, uh, tarmac. Um, uh, and so Mrs. Daniels would always settle us down by reading Little Britches. And it was just a great, uh, series of books about a boy growing up in the West uh, in Colorado as a and then sixth grade Mrs. Bonner 
This was 1963, 64. Um, there were things starting to happen that were kind of interesting. Um, we did, uh, the, the boys, and you know, they, they were starting to do this thing on the playground where you would hyperventilate and then have a big strong guy squeeze you tight so you'd black out. And, and this was before uh, you'd, you'd black out and then you'd have these sort of hallucinations. And this was before drugs came to Davis, to, to our age group anyway. We were trying to get high, and it was by you know, hyperventilating and, and then doing some kind of thing where we would pass out and then hallucinate and have these go into some kind of altered state. This was 19, this was the spring of 1964 and so there was you know the the, the drug um, the 60s seemed to be something that was just happening in our minds um, despite you know independent of the drugs that we that my peers later took up I was very um, I you know I did some but not 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 nearly as much as my other peers later after you know in the late 60s after we got back from africa so then um we uh we also um built skateboards they were not sold at that time and so we took roller skates and pounded the the uh the fittings that went around your shoes and pounded those off of the skates nailed them to a board and then went and found any driveways that had any slope and of course davis had no hills and so with 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 you know smooth concrete so we went to the mansfield's driveway which had a slope over in um old west davis and so we did skateboards we um we also started listening to Jan and Dean and the Beach Boys. It wasn't until later that we started uh, buying the um, the Beatles records after we had gone to um, Africa, and that's a whole different story where we were with the British. But before we left in 1964, we were mainly we were listening to Jan and Dean and the Beach Boys. And then I remember hearing the, the Stones, the Rolling Stones, um, hit uh, I Can't Get No Satisfaction on a little radio, little uh, transistor radio sitting sitting in the on the curb um, of Osti Drive. So the summer of 64, we did a couple of trips. Um, we went backpacking with the Youngermans up um, somewhere in the, I, guess, I think it was the Southern Sierra. We um, hired uh, pack uh, horses. We, we um, had pack horses, you know, pack our stuff in. We also went up to, the, did a trip up to the ranch. Uh, the Vernon, you know, the ranch that Dad had gone to when he was young it had been Uncle Will's ranch, uh, and Uncle Will and Aunt Cora now uh, was uh, belonged to his son Ben Vernon. They had two kids, Jackie, and anyway, um, so Ben, Ben in Virginia, Vern, Vernon. And Ben entered us into the um, the local um, during the county fair. They had a rodeo, and he entered us, Mike and I, into the the rodeo to ride uh, one-year-old uh, steers. And you know we were we were riding the other boys, all our age, um, 11, 12. 13, 14, we're all in, you know, right, wearing cowboy hats and 
had cowboy boots and chaps and stuff, and we were in our UC Davis sweatshirts and tennis, you know, sneakers, Converse sneakers. I just remember getting on to this young, young, you know, a year old, and the cowboy. It was in it was in the pen where you know the 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 rodeo rides all start in this this small pen with that they would open and they had me sit down on this this young you know this young steer and tied my put my hands down on the neck and tied my hands down really tight and i said i won't they my hands won't come out and <laughs> The cowboy who was doing that said, Sonny, those, you're going to have no problem getting your hands out. And they, they, uh, so he cinched down my hands and the gate opened and out I, you know, we went. And I just remember the crowd in the, the uh, grandstand spinning by about once every second. And that thing threw me off. After about seven or eight seconds, as I recall, it was right when the there's an eight second you have eight second ride and then the, and then a whistle blows and that means you're you've done the ride you you succeeded and I I you know have some recollection of that whistle going off um, or that horn going off as I was flying through the air and the cowboy ran up to me and off the cowboy comes out and he slaps a two dollar bill in my hand. Two dollar bills were, you know, I'd never seen one before. Picked me up and dusted me off, you know, and, and um, pointed me in the direction of the, of um, where mom and dad were sitting and where I had started. And I kind of, I, I just remember making my way towards towards the stands. And mom and dad were so petrified that there were no photos of us, of either Mike or I. They had a camera but they didn't uh, take any photos of us. So anyway, uh, Mike got thrown off after just two or three seconds. Um, he had a, you know, a, a pretty wild one. So anyway, that was our experience of riding in a rodeo. You know, spent time riding the, um, the old horse Sam on the ranch and went out and shot. Dad had brought up his uh, 2520 Winchester that he had inherited from uh, Grandpa Vernon. Um, Grandpa Vernon was brother of that family. Um, Uncle Will, who Dad had, um, Dad had come up to the ranch when he was in, in the 1930s when he was young, and Uncle Will was the son of the oldest of the Vernon uh, boys, nine boys, and and uh, Aunt Grace. At home in Sunset Court, after school, we would play in the court with often the plows or the, um, usually the plow kids, sometimes the Harris kids. Um, and then we would have dinner, mom's dinners. And mom would run through 20 or 30 typical American dinners, often um, hamburgers, cheeseburgers. Uh, hot dogs, uh, fish sticks, cream tuna on toast, meatloaf, the occasional pot roast in a pressure cooker, um, sometimes roast beef, other times um, sloppy joes, baked chicken with Uncle Ben's rice, chicken pot pies, and for dessert there were always Hydrox cookies as opposed to Oreos. Mom was a Hydrox mom. Um, or oatmeal cookies, sometimes ice cream. And then we would watch television. Our favorite shows were those typical of the 60s, the Flintstones, uh, the, um, oh, the cowboy shows, any shows that were on before 8 or 8.30. Occasionally, Mom would let me 
stay up and watch things like I Love Lucy, uh, and which was her favorite show. She would always watch that. On Sunday nights, we would often go over to the Harrises, who had the first color television in the neighborhood, and we would watch Walt Disney's Wide World of Color. Once a year, we would go over there to watch the, um, the Wizard of Oz. On weekend mornings, we would watch uh, cartoons. Uh, the Little Rascals were a favorite of ours, as well as uh, the Three Stooges. On weekends, we would go quite often every couple of weeks to the Varsity Theater. They had double bills back then. I remember watching PT-109, um, the, uh, the Mouse That Roared, the uh, Pink Panther movies. Um, the, and then occasionally, Dad would take us to Sacramento to the, uh, I guess what they called it, Cinemascope. Uh, big screen to watch things like How the West Was Won. At the Varsity, we would take to these double features. We would take our lunch boxes, these metal lunch boxes that, you know, were, were uh, rectangular and had, you know, were some kind of cartoon drawing on the front or some kind of TV character. And in between movies, there, you know, there would be 20 minutes and we would go out in the lobby and eat uh, whatever food mom packed and then go in and watch the main feature. Every year we had several over-the-fence clod fights, dirt clods. The Yolo County clod is pretty good ammo because it's... It was completely against the rules to throw rocks and our BB guns, it was not even, it didn't even enter into our, our heads to use them on anybody uh, except the poor birds and things out, way out on the countryside. But the dirt clod was pretty good because when it hit, you know, I mean, fewer than 1% would hit a kid's head. But when it did, it would just shatter. It would leave a nice strawberry breaking the skin on the kid's head and then break apart. Okay, YOLO, fine sandy loam. So we had clod fights with the Elmwood kids, as those houses were being built one by one, the properties slowly, you know, went from 10% of Elmwood to 20, 30, and then the whole thing. So there were all these vacant lots and lots of clods, as well as over the, the fences to the Oste Drive uh, neighbors like uh, Andy and David Williams and occasionally the Boohers. And um, nobody got badly hurt. In the fall of 1964, I started seventh grade at Davis Junior High School down Russell Boulevard, which was the old high school and is now the city hall complex. So I'd ride my bike down Russell Boulevard along with the other boys who lived out this way, Robert Yamaguchi, Tommy Hayes. Um, I do re remember one incident. I was only in, you know, it was September, October, November, and then we left for the Peace Corps. So it was, I was only three months in seventh grade of junior high school. But we had an eight o'clock chemistry class, and the young chemistry teacher came in one day, it was 8 o'clock, he was obviously sleepy, went to the back room, brought out some things, some jars of stuff to demonstrate, and I remember these two bars, 
it was going to take out, I think, calcium and something else and show us. And I remember seeing this jar um, of these two white bars in water. He took them out, took one of them out, put it on the table, and it promptly caught on fire. It was phosphorus. This was back when they didn't have all those things controlled as they do now for, you know, schools and teachers. And so smoke billowed out of these, this bar of, of phosphorus. And so, you know, the, he put the fire alarm on and we all had to go out. Fire department came and the poor guy, uh, I don't know what, um, definitely was, uh, got in trouble for that. So seventh grade, by that time, kids were starting to get social. Lunchtime, I heard about dances and things that they were doing. But I would go to the library, the, uh, the school library, and I remember checking out books. I remember reading, um, what was it, Men and Mountains? about um, and the story of Jim Bridger which later became a movie um, with um, Leonardo DiCaprio about Jim Bridger um, being attacked by a grizzly bear and surviving and then having been abandoned well I read all that when I was 12 years old um, in the library I was kind of a, a loner I loved just reading and this went way back um, mom spent four months in bed out in that little country cottage outside of the crossroads of Danville on a ranch. Um, she spent four months. Dad was, would be gone all day teaching and then coaching. And so she read in bed all day. Well, and then what do I, what do I do? What am I going to do after I finish this will talk well. I'll be reading in bed. I'm in bed now. And so uh, I started, well, mom and dad read to us um, the little golden books, and then I started reading on my own. I would, at, when we spent that year in Berkeley, I would walk up to the Berkeley City Library. Uh, I was in first grade, check out books. I would go to the, when we were back in Davis, after um, Mrs. Daniels read the, the series, the Little Britches series, I found out that there, were, there was one more called Shaking the Nickel Bush about how he goes um, back west from having been living in Massachusetts, having grown up as a, as a you know, little cowboy, and he goes back west. And I remember the, uh, the librarian lady saying, isn't this book a little old for you? you know, the, <laughs> but I was reading, um, I was a voracious reader, when, when I went up to Craigmont Park, and I was up there, and there was just an old man, and I, but now I remember I was reading, I, I was carrying a book, a paperback book, thick book, called The Doughboys. The Doughboys were the soldiers, the American soldiers of World War I, and that, the old guy saw that, and that's how he, that's how we got into the, you know, he told me that he had been a, a soldier in World War I and been wounded in the stomach. So that's how we got onto that topic. Um, I read all, a, a whole bunch of books. I read all the, the Hardy Boy books. Um, and then also there was a series, um, I can't remember the, the name of the series, but they were for, you know, um, I don't know, average 10, 11 year olds, read a whole bunch of those. Then, uh, I was reading paperbacks. And so one day after we had gone to Africa and we were in a car with two Peace Corps volunteers, um, and I was reading a book on the USS Enterprise, the aircraft carrier, a big thick book, kind of typical of me, just reading the story of the Enterprise going through World War II and, and this guy, Larry Stallings. Um, looked at it and said, yeah, that, that's my father who wrote that. And I looked at the author and it was Lawrence Stallings. 
So I've been reading ever since. It's um, reading is such a great way to um, have your mind to to cultivate your mind because you you actually you're given a framework, but you have to create the picture. Okay, which is so much better than sitting back and you know watching TV and movies, which I enjoy. Um, but you don't have that co-creating process. Another book that I loved was one that I found when we were in Washington D.C. And I it was went to the book rack, uh, you know, one of those spinning paperback uh, book racks uh, in a drugstore, and found a book called The Long Walk, and. It, it was, you know, like 25 cents. It was about a Polish officer who had been captured by the uh, Soviets who had invaded Poland along with Germany from opposite sides and been sent to the gulags, the uh, POW camps in Siberia. And he escaped with five others and walked to India and this, that story great story as an avid reader of books and now listener of audiobooks I've read and listened to a number of memoirs and three good ones that come to my mind are Matthew McConaughey's Green Light really good Will Smith his memoir called Will also really good and then Bruce Springsteen his memoir each of these read by the author. And then just remembering so many other memoirs by famous people, I am struck by how many of them had very difficult childhoods, often with a father who drove them, or just circumstances that they had to overcome. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure of this, but I'm thinking that these successful people who have that drive and in combination obviously with talent but that drive these stars who've reached the top are i believe in the 0.1 percent of people who were driven by the i guess demons of childhood and in this group of people who had these demons this drivenness 99.9 percent .9 i i think did not become super wealthy uh, famous rich and have been dealing all of their lives with addictions alcoholism decades of therapy uh, workaholism and so that group that forms the people with demons and whatever i'm thinking that they are probably a minority at least of the peers who I grew up with, because what I'm saying here is that I did not have the parenting or the circumstances in my life that gave me those demons or to, that drive some people. I've seen so many of my peers who are the same, many of the kids who grew up in Sunset Court, and so I'm thankful for that. There's a family I know with several boys whose father drove them hard when they were young, each of those boys went towards the top of each of their respective professions and efforts and made a name for themselves. But they now all have demons. And I, you know, and my brothers don't. And I'm thankful for that. For that. I had gentle, loving parents who raised me with tolerance. A big influence on how we were raised by mom and dad was my dad's great aunt, Grace. Aunt Grace, the sister of dad's grandfather, Elliot Vernon, who was one of, let's see, she had nine brothers. She could ride a horse and shoot a gun just as well as any of her brothers was raised on the ranch in Lakeview, Oregon. And they used to go visit 
Aunt Grace up in Modoc County. I think it was either Cedarville or Susanville where she lived and she had eight kids of her own. And she, dad used to quote the Aunt Grace to us every year. She'd say, Willard, if any of those kids goes bad, it's their own darn fault because I always let them do as they pleased. And that was a big influence on how my dad and mom raised us. And lo and behold, none of us has gone bad. We're all living good lives. Nor do we have the demons from being driven too hard as children. So that group of people who had the challenging or traumatic childhoods and who have those demons driving them, but did not achieve the fame and success and had to deal with those demons of that difficult upbringing with alcoholism, addiction, decades of therapy, nightmares. And I'm just thinking this, I'm not absolutely sure, but one thing that is for sure, I'm here to say that my upbringing in Davis, California, by loving parents, Will and Jane, a very forgiving, tolerant, gentle, and so I don't have those things driving me, I guess, demons driving me, or something that is causing that kind of drive that I have seen in so many of the very, very successful people who have that profound and almost desperate need to rise to the very top of whatever sector of society they work in. And so I've been content with small things all of my life, enjoying wandering, exploring, creating new things, but not having to reach for the top, I suppose. And I see this as being the case of for my brothers and for so many of the other kids in Sunset Court. So while that large group that had the demons put into them as children, where 0.1% become celebrities and very successful, and the other 99.9% but they demons, that's another group. Hopefully, a minority of my peers. And so I'm here to say I'm one of those who is not driven to become rich and famous and just enjoys small things and always has.